ready to go. Welcome dear friends and our viewers on Instagram and Facebook Live and of course our friends on Zoom. Uh, the topic tonight is Astrological Secrets of the Hebrew Months. If you're interested in astrology and the Jewish view of astrology, I have some amazing ideas to share with you. This really is set up as a two-part series. However, we may be able to crunch it down into one. Let's see how we do this evening, my dear friends, as we are share some beautiful secrets, uh, because there's a lot to say on this topic, surprisingly. And actually, in my first book, Do you Got Questions, I put a large chapter on this book. And second to uh, dreams and dating, uh, this topic definitely gets a lot of questions. What is the Jewish view of astrology? Do we believe in horoscopes? Is there a tall, dark, handsome stranger who's waiting for you? I mean, if you want them to, hopefully they will be. If you don't, then probably not a good idea. Um, Mazel Tov. Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov. We've all heard that expression many, many times. Somebody just gave birth to a baby boy or girl. You found out that someone you love is about to get married. They're engaged. Someone just started a new job. They started their first day at school. And we always say the same thing. Mazel Tov. What does that expression even mean? When you say Mazel Tov, what precisely are you saying and why? So, contrary to common belief, the idea of Mazel Tov does not mean good luck. Luck is not an idea you find in Jewish law, Jewish life, or Jewish philosophy. We don't believe in luck. God controls the world. So Mazel Tov cannot be good luck. And if it does mean good luck, it's pretty offensive, isn't it? I mean, oh, you're about to get married. Yeah, good luck with that. Oh, you just gave birth to twins. Good luck with that. Obviously, luck is not what we're dealing with over here. So what exactly does the word Mazal mean? I'll give you two interpretations. The first one is actually a bracha. You're giving this person a blessing. You're praying for them that she things should nizul. Nizul means to flow. Things should flow well. Mazal, say the rabbis, is connected to the word nizul. Actually, if a person has a cold, we say they have a nizila, right? Things should flow well for you. Things should just move on nicely. And if this is the path you're meant to be on, if this is the person you're meant to marry, this is your child, things should flow well and they should be with great mazal. So, According to that interpretation, the word mazal tov means things should flow tov in a good fashion for you, nicely and evenly with health and success. What a beautiful blessing to give someone. So really, it's a tefillah in the form of a bracha. There's another interpretation. And the word mazal, which is probably the true interpretation, the word mazal comes from the word mazalot. And the mazalot are the astrological signs, the various houses, of which there are 12, that are always present in this world. And when you say to a person, Mazal Tov, you're saying that whatever event is about to happen to you, whether it's a wedding, marriage, job, or whatever, it should be, as we say to a person who's about to give birth, B'Sha'ah Tova. At a good time. The time of the birth should be with a good timing to it. Because timing is everything. And that means the stars should align in the right way. At the moment where you are getting married or whatever. Because we want things to result to flow well. And there are certain agencies that God himself set up, called the Mazalot, the astrological houses. And each one of them comes with a different power, with a different koach that can, that do influence this world. 
So when something comes from, I'm just explaining it away that from my extensive reading, when a decision is made in heaven, it passes into this world, whatever that decision is, in this world, country, another country, and there's a certain power, Shefa, that is passing through to this world. And when you say Mazal Tov, you're saying that it should come around and arrive at the right time. And all the astrological signs, whatever they mean, and we're going to go through a few of them, should be in the right place at the right time. So obviously we're not talking about horoscopes. The idea of a horoscope that you read in the paper is not accurate. That is not to say that there are people who have the ability to study and to be able to interpret where the various planets and stars are that can give you information. That's not to say that that power does not exist, because we're going to see from the Gemara, it does exist, but there's going to be a get out. There's going to be a way that we, the Jewish people, are able to be above the stars, above the astrological signs and the hashpa'a, the power that they bring into this world. And where do we see this? Where do we see that we have the ability to somehow move out of the way or to change a decree that has come through these astrological means? And what do we even mean when we say that? So let's go back and let's visit one of the earliest sources describing astrology. And interestingly enough, it's based on a story in the Torah, and Rashi himself mentions it. That's a thousand years ago. And it's based upon a Gemara, which obviously precedes Rashi by a thousand years or more before his appearance on the scene. And the story is all about Avraham Avinu. And at this point, it wasn't Avraham, it was Avram. And it wasn't Sarah, it was Sarai. And God said to Abraham, you are going to have a son through your wife, Sarah. At that point, she was Sarai. And he says, how is that possible? How am I going to have a child? I'm very old. She's very old. And then he says something which is unbelievable. He says, God, it's not possible for me and my wife, Sarah, to have a child because I know astrology, says Abraham. And I looked and I saw that my mazal, that my astrological fortune that I found, told me I'm going to have one child. And that child I already have. That's my child through my other wife, Hagar, and our child, Yishmael. So it's not possible because you set up this astrological system and according to the rules that you set up, I'm only destined to have one child. And I have that child. So how can you come along and tell me that I'm going to have another child? When astrologically speaking, my mazal, the astrological house that I am in, is not going to allow me to have a child. And God says something unbelievable. And the conversation is actually recorded in the Gemara. And God says to Abraham, and by the way, this is going to apply to his descendants, the Jewish people, release yourself from the influence of the Mazalot, the stars, because the Jewish people are above the stars. And one opinion is that he actually took them outside to see the stars and say, you're not bound by them. But there's another opinion which Rashi himself brings down that God, whatever this means, lifted Abraham above the stars. So he actually looked down upon them and said, you are above them. They don't control you the way you think that they do. Your ruling planet is Tzedek, Jupiter, which appears in the West. Based on its influence, you're not meant to have any more children. However, I'm going to move Jupiter, rather apropos for what's happening right now, actually, I didn't plan it this way, to Tzedek in the East. So God says that you right now are being influenced. You're right. There is an influence which is coming from Jupiter, which is decreeing that you cannot have more than one child. However, 
I have the ability, says God, to change the mazal. Because this is God. And it's going to go from the west to the east. And according to your new mazal, which is also going to be represented by your name change, Avram to Avraham, and your wife's name change from Sarai to Sarah, you are going to have another child. You're going to have a second child. And that, say the sources, is the ability that Abraham showed us that even though there is a real astrological influence that brings down decisions, whatever this means, into the world, we have the ability, and we'll see how, to change that. To change that. Now, what are we talking about over here? So the Gemara gives a couple of opinions. There are actually different times during the day. There are 12 houses that we're actually going to go through during this class. 12 star signs that all of you are familiar with. But the Gemara says it's not just months, it's also hours of the day. And there are 12 constellations that spread out with two hours per day according to each constellation. So each constellation is given two hours every single day. And they have influence on the world. And so the timing, not just the month that something falls in, but also the hour of the day has an incredible impact on a person. The Gemara tells us that was a great rabbi called Rava. This is the Gemara in Shabbat. And Rava says that the houses that a person is born under influences their personality. Not just what happens to them, but who they are. And Rava says, I, everyone knows, am from the influence of Mars, which is a blood sign, a blood sign, which means, says the Gemara, that Rava had a tendency to want blood. That's a natural tendency. And so he's like, so what do you want from me? What should I be doing with this tendency? And the Gemara says, well, Rava, and anyone else born under Mars, has the ability to channel that desire for blood any way they want. They could become a murderer, but they also could become a butcher, a slaughterer, a mohel, a surgeon, work for Atsala, I don't know. There's a certain inclination that a person gets from their star sign, but also they get it potentially from the hour of the day they are born. Not just that, even the moment they're married. I'll tell you a very famous story. It happened to a friend of mine. He was performing a wedding and the groom was very, very nervous. And you know that the moment the ring goes on the finger, Mukudesha, you're married. There's various stages. That's one of the major key stages, if not the major stage. That's where you have witnesses come under the chuppah, as they should be, two witnesses, to watch the ring go on the finger. He was about to put it on the finger and he dropped it and fell on the floor. A little awkward. And he picked it up and he was still shaking a little bit and sweating and it dropped it again. And he's looking around for it and people are laughing. But he felt, and there was a great rabbi who was standing right next to them and says, obviously that wasn't the moment they were meant to be married. The mazal of this couple wasn't then. It was one minute later. Now for me and you, that's almost irrelevant. But if you look at it through astrological means and powers, it could well be that this chef of this power had come down into the world and they got married at that exact moment because it's not just a monthly thing that we're going to go through, but the mazal, the astrological powers, is actually divided up. Each one of the 12 signs we're going to see is a sign two hours every single day. And so when you get married, when something happens to you, when you say mazal tov, you're actually really saying it should be at the right moment, that all the stars should be aligning. But Abraham was told that that wasn't necessary. Abraham was told, you don't need that. You're above the stars, right? You are lamala mela mazalot. You ride above. How can it be? Either the stars are influencing us or they're not influencing us. Either astrology is true or it's not true. And the answer is, it's a little bit of both. If a person connects to God like Abraham did, 
and now day through Torah mitzvot, we have the ability to overcome any astrological forecast that has been put our way. But if a person does and they disregard it, then God says, no problem. You don't need part of this lot above the astrological science. I'll put you as an influence like all the other 70 nations that you'll be under their influence. So really it's in our hands. And Abraham was asking that. He said, I don't understand. The astrological signs you set up say, I'm not going to have another kid. And Hashem said to him, you're a man of faith. You're connected to me. I says, God, I created the muzzle. If you connect to me, you're not influenced. But if you don't want to connect to me and you don't want to be involved in Torah Mitzvah, no problem. You'll go under the stars, which could be good or potentially not good. It's all dependent on your mazal, which in a very big way depends upon when you were born. The moment, the month, the day, the hour, and the minute that a person is born decrees what that person's mazal is going to be for the rest of their lives. Can they overcome that forecast? The answer is absolutely, absolutely they can. Now, let me be very clear about something else over here. That's why I try to make it a two-part series. I'm going to try to get through as much as possible today, though, and do another part another time. It is forbidden to go to an astrologer. And I'm saying this as someone who went to an astrologer and had a full, very detailed report, not the horoscope nonsense, a real astrologer many, many years ago when I was a youngster because I was fascinated in this topic and read a lot of books on it. This is before I got involved in reading Torah and rabbinic literature on it, which is much more interesting and obviously truthful. But it is forbidden to go. How do we know this? What is the source of this? So the Ramban Nachmanides, who happened to be a great Kabbalist himself, says there, are pas- there is a Pasuk in the Torah. And the Pasuk in the Torah says, Tamim im Hashem You should be perfect with the Lord your God. What does that mean? You should be perfect. Tamim. Be perfect. Be, be tam. Be almost simple in your faith of God. And the Gemara tells us that that actually means that you're not allowed to go to astrologers or to mediums or anything else in order to forecast the future. That is a halacha. It is forbidden, says the Shulchan Aruch, to go to an astrologer to try to find out about the future. That a person cannot do. Is a person allowed to go to a great Torah scholar and find out through astrological means about their personality? That would be permitted. That would be, but you have to be careful. You have to know who you're going to. That would be permitted. But that's not portending the future, okay? If a person is able to figure out the future, like a person comes to me and says, I'm in a relationship and this is what's happening. I'm like, wait, you know, be careful. This is going to happen. I'm not forecasting the future. I'm not a prophet. Based upon what I'm seeing in front of me, this is almost an inevitable action unless you change your ways. That's not forecasting the future. What is not permitted is if a person tries to go to an astrologer or a medium and say, what does the future hold for me? When you do that, you're removing yourself from God and you're putting yourself under other powers that according to Nachmanides, Ramban, with an N at the end, says, have power in this world. So you're not allowed to do it. It's a Pasuk, it's an Isram in a Torah. It is forbidden to go to the Torah to go to a medium. That's not to say they don't have power because according to the Ramban, they do have power. Now, according to the Rambam, Maimonides, it's all nonsense. People don't have these powers to predict the future. There's no such thing as a medium. He's a rationalist. But you still can't go to them because the Torah says you're not allowed to. Why? Because it's going to lead you astray to get involved in stupidity, lead you away from a, Torah, a life of Torah and mitzvot, and you'll end up making this into your religion, maybe become an idol worshiper at some point. So both agree that it is forbidden to go to an astrologer or to go to a medium, but they look at it from different ways. According to the Kabbalists, it's because these powers are real and they're going to lead you astray from God and the real path that you should be on. The other opinion is that it's all nonsense. These are people who are charlatans trying to take your money, but you shouldn't go because they're going to lead you astray because they're going to take your money and you're going to lose your faith in God. So two different approaches as to why it's forbidden. Having said that, and the Gemara says this, and even the Shulchan Aruch and other commentators, later commentators say this too. 
If you do get information from an astrologer, and maybe even a medium, but we'll leave that for another discussion, and this person is reputable, you are allowed to act in a cautionary manner regarding what you've heard. So you didn't go to inquire of them, but, but some information got through to you. Now, once again, no matter what they told you, through your actions and your connection to God, you are able to rise above the astrological signs. And I'm going to give you a wild story from the Talmud involving the great Rabbi Akiva and his daughter. And Rabbi Akiva was approached, I say that clearly, by a famous astrologer in his day. We're talking 2,000 years ago. And this astrologer told Rabbi Akiva that one day he was going to have a daughter. And this daughter was going to grow up. She was going to get engaged. And on her wedding day, she was going to die. That, said the astrologer to Rabbi Akiva, is the decree from the astrological houses that your daughter is going to die on her wedding day. Now, if heaven forbid anyone heard that information, they would probably go out of their mind, right? They would dismiss it. They would pray to God. Rabbi Akiva, see, we're not told, seemed to ignore it. Or maybe he prayed to God about it. We're not too sure. But he didn't take it that seriously. On her wedding day, this young daughter of Rabbi Akiva was preparing herself for her upcoming chuppah. And she was putting on her dress and she was getting her hair ready. And while she was getting her hair ready, she took the pin out. Things haven't changed so much. And she stuck it in the wall, which was, I guess, what they used to do. They used to have like, they used to stick the hairpin in the wall, a little sharp object. And it went into the wall. Chopa happened. She got married. Rabbi Kiva came back after it was that evening. Looks at his daughter. She's still there. And listen to Rabbi Kiva, the great Rabbi Kiva, not one of the greatest rabbis of Jewish history. He says, wow, you're still alive. That astrologer told me you are going to die on your wedding day. And she's like, well, I'm still here. So he's like, well, tell me, did anything unusual happen during the day? And she's like, no, nothing really unusual. And he walked into her room and he saw a pin in the wall. And he said, what's that? He said, this is the pin I took out of my hair and I stuck in the wall. And he went around to the other side of the wall. He broke it through and he saw there was a poisonous snake that somehow had been penetrated by her pin and it killed the snake. And he's like, what? That snake was going to kill you. That's a very poisonous snake. What happened during the day? Did anything unusual happen? And she says, no, I was getting ready. I had my dress on, doing my hair. And there was a knock at the door. And we were very busy and the whole wedding was about to happen. But there was a poor man at the door and he was really, really hungry. I felt terrible. So I invited him in and I prepared a little meal for him on my wedding day. And he ate it and he felt good and he gave me a blessing and he left. And then this whole incident with the pin happened. And Rabbi Kiva says, now I understand what the rabbis mean when they tell us. That chesed, doing acts of kindness, can save a person's life. No matter what the astrological signs are that come upon a person, that are forecast even accurately, we know that doing chesed, doing acts of kindness, following the Torah and doing mitzvot, can save a person from certain death. We have the ability, through our free will actions, to rise above the zodiac. So you may be born under the star sign of Mars and you may be someone who wants to bring out blood, but it's up to you. How are you going to relate to it? Okay, so let's move to the next phase. We now know that there is certain times of the day, but also certain times of the year and month where various influences take root, have power. 
And I actually led a trip, uh, many trips to Israel. And on one trip, the tour guide took us to a beautiful synagogue up north. And there was, a, you couldn't walk into, it was an ancient synagogue. And there was a mosaic, a beautiful round mosaic on the floor of this synagogue. And you see on the floor the 12 star signs, the mazalot. And I was like, I was, I was like, what's going on over here? In a synagogue? And he's like, yeah, this is part of our history. The mazalot relate to the 12 months of the Jewish year, which is why the English, have you noticed, ever wondered this, why do the English star signs not appear at the beginning of the month? Right? Why does Aquarius appear in the middle of January? I said that because I am an Aquarian. Why exactly does it appear in the middle, right? Not January 1st or February 1st. Because it actually coincides, or it should coincide, with the Hebrew month. Because that's actually when the Mazal begins. The Mazal begins at the beginning of the Jewish month. And actually the word for a month is Chodesh. So when you say Rosh Chodesh, Tov, a person shall be, you're actually saying Rosh means the head, Chodesh of the month, and Chadash should be new. There is a new energy according to the moon that appears because we the Jewish people, our calendar is moon-based according to the waxing and waning of the new moon. That's how we begin our new month. Now we do coincide with the sun. So we're not like the Muslims whose months travel through the year, like Ramadan goes backwards and backwards. We align our months with the solar calendar as well. This is very important. This is based upon the idea that Pesach, which is in Nisan, as we're going to see in a moment, must appear in Chodesh Aviv, the springtime, because we're going to see that springtime is a time of freedom. And so Pesach must appear in the springtime. So we have to, there's an 11 day or something difference between the solar and lunar calendar. And therefore there is an extra month thrown into the year to push our moon months forward to allow Pesach and all the other holidays to appear in the right season as well as the right moon month as well. Okay, so let's now, we're going to try to begin, maybe we'll finish it today. If not, I'll do another class on it. Let's now go through the months themselves. Each month, Say the rabbis, a number of books, including the Sefer Yitzirah, and one of my great and friends, actually a neighbor of mine, a great elderly rabbi, Rabbi Glazerson, who's an expert in this. And he spoke to me about this and gave me his book on this, which I incorporated into my own book. And each month has its own power. Each month has its own message. And that is going to be represented by the astrological symbol of every single month. So let's begin with the first month. And what is the first month of the Jewish year? The first Chodesh. Now, you may be thinking, well, that would be Rosh Hashanah, right? Because Rosh Hashanah begins the new year, and therefore the month that Rosh Hashanah falls in, which is Tishrei, should be the first month. And that's when the Jewish year begins. And that was true until a certain point in history. And that point, my friends, was when the Jewish people were about to leave Egypt, Mitzrayim. Because Tishrei, and the first of Tishrei, celebrates the creation of mankind. But the beginning of Nisan, which is six months later, the seventh month actually after Tishrei, begins the Jewish New Year. I know that sounds extraordinary to you. We actually have four New Year's. I'm not going to go through them now, but two of them we have now seen. One Jewish New Year, my friends, is the creation of mankind on the first of Tishrei. But the other New Year, which is relevant to us, is the first day of the month of Nisan. That's the month that Pesach falls in. Because it was the first mitzvah given to the Jewish people in Egypt. Actually, in Egypt, before the Torah was given. They were told, told, set up a calendar. Because now the Jewish year begins with Nisan. Because this is the month that you are going free. And so, my dear friends, we have the first Jewish astrological sign 
and month, Nisan. Not only that, it gets a little bit more interesting, actually a lot more. We know there are 12 tribes. We know that Jacob had 12 sons. And each one of these 12 sons was given a different part to live in in the land of Israel. But did you know that each one of them was given a different month that their tribe was in control of and their tribe had power of? So we're going to look at a month. We're going to look at the energy that exists in that month. We're going to look at the astrological sign that goes with it. And then... We're going to look at the Hebrew tribe, the Jewish tribe, of which there are 12, that is going to fall into that month as well. So that's the way we're going to play the game today. And let's have a look at the astrological influence of each and every Hebrew month. And we're going to have to begin, like we said, with the month of Nisan. The month of Nisan is the first Jewish month. And obviously, it's a time of redemption. That is the power of the month, the power of redeeming, which makes sense because that was the month the Jewish people were redeemed from Egypt. And that is the star sign of the lamb. The lamb is the star sign, right? And that is Aries. Aries. Why a lamb? What was, what's a lamb doing? Well, If you can put one and one together, you should get two. If we're in Egypt and we're about to be redeemed and it's Nisan, which is the month of redemption, there was a lamb. That lamb was the Korban Pesach, the Paschal lamb. And that is the animal that is led by the shepherd, by its owner. And just like a lamb is defenseless and simple and led from one place to another, so to the Jewish people were like a lamb being led from Egypt by God into into, um, redemption into the desert. And so that is the star sign of Nisan, of Aries, of the lamb that is taken free. And the lamb actually went through a conversion. Because the Egyptians used to worship the lamb. It was one of the Avodah Zaraz, one of the um, idols that they would worship, which is why they didn't like the Jews, because the Jewish people were shepherds when they were living in Egypt. What did we do? We took their god, small g, we killed it. We took the blood and put it on our doorposts, which was a sign for God to jump over our homes, Pasach, to Pasach means to leap over our homes, kill the Egyptian firstborn, and then we cooked their God and we ate it. And there's a whole discussion of itself. But the lamb is going to represent redemption. The lamb is going to, the airy sign. People born in this month have the power of redemption. And now that's going to fit in to the tribe of Nisan, which is Yehuda, Judah. Judah, as we know, is where the Jewish kings come from, where Jewish kings come from. Now, although Moshe Rabbeinu did not come from the tribe of Judah, he came from the tribe of Levi. He was a Levite and he was our king at that time. But in the future, King David, after King Saul, was given the power of kingship. And that was handed down to him and each of his descendants until Mashiach. There is an opinion that the redemption in the final days will happen in Nisan. Because that's when the first ever redemption of the Jewish people happened. But this month has the power of redemption. And therefore, the Redeemer, Mashiach, the great, 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 great grandson of King David, right? The first king of Judah is actually going to appear in that time itself, okay? The power of this is speech. Nisan is a time of good speech, right? The word Pesach means Pesach, the mouth speaks. So the rabbis tell us that 
the past that Haggadah we read, Lahagid is to tell over. So the Jewish month that we were redeemed in and God willing will be redeemed in again is going to be, and that's going to come through good speech, specifically not speaking Lashon Hara, negative speech, which causes exile, which causes Galut. We know the Jewish people were exiled because they spoke Lashon Hara, and therefore the redemption is going to come through good speech as well. So what's the next month? So we'll do as many as we can, and then we'll revisit this. The next month is the month of Iyar. Now, Iyar is represented by the ox. It's Taurus, right? Taurus is the ox sign, and that is Iyar, and that represents hard work. What does the ox do? The ox is a creature that drags the plow, that plods along, getting the job done. Getting the job done. Now, where are we over here? That's the shore. That's the shore. Um, in the Bible, the month of Eir is actually called the month of Ziv, which means radiance, right? It's, it's related to the idea of, of light, okay? Er. Or it's got light in it. Why? Because we're making our way from Mitzrayim to the light of the Torah, which is going to be coming to us in the next month. But this is going to be the preparation. And so we prepare ourselves by counting the Omer from Pesach, 49 days to Shavuot, and the intermediary month is the month of Iyar. And that is a time for introspection, just like an ox doesn't usually move around in packs like other animals, like dogs or geese. It's alone. It's, in, it's introspection. Okay, I'm working on myself and I'm trying to prepare myself in this month. So the symbol, the shore, the bull or the ox is a creature that lives in isolation and self-development is what we need to be working on at this time. Now, Yisachar is the tribe that were given this month. They represent the month of Iyar. Of Iyar. Why is that? Who were they? Well, actually, they were the scholarly tribe of Israel. Right? We're going to see later on, there is a tribe called Zavulun. Zavulun were the sailors, the um, people who worked on the ships and harbors to make money, and they would support the Yisachar people to study Torah. Right, there was a uh, Yisachar Zavulun um, partnership. There, that's where the great sages came from, for the tribe of Yisachar. Okay, and they were actually the masters of the secret of the Jewish calendar. And so, when they sit and they study, they are representing the power of the ox. It, it takes power and energy to sit and to study, so you can emulate an ox which is there to take you and your things to another place. So where's that? So this is like a trifecta. What starts as a lamb, we leave and become strong like an ox in preparation for the Torah. And then we get to the third month, which is Sivan. Sivan is the third month. And Sivan is the month that we receive the Torah. What is the star sign of Sivan? That's Gemini. Gemini, the twins. The twins. So what's happening over there? Well, something's interesting over here. First of all, we've gone from lamb to ox, right? We've gone from Aries to Taurus. And now we've gone to a human, right? Because the twins, if you look at the image, the symbol, are twin humans. Why would that be? Why is that important? Well, when you have two, you have unity. You have achdut. You're combining. You're pulling two disparate parts together. And one opinion is when the Jewish people were at Har Sinai and received the Torah on the sixth day of Sivan, it was us, as it were, and God. There was a twin unified effect. Or the unity of the twins is us and each other. Because if we want to receive the Torah, there needs to be achdut. And actually the greatest achdut, the greatest unity the Jewish people ever had is represented by these twins of Gemini that appear in the month of Sivan 
because we were ish echad belev echad. We were one people, says the Torah, with one heart. And in that merit, we were able to receive the Torah. The relationship between God and the Jewish people is like a bride and a groom. And according to one opinion, the Mount Sinai was held over our heads like a chuppah as we married God at that time through his Torah at that moment. Okay? Now, Zavulan, say the rabbis, is the only tribe with the Hebrew letter Zion in it, in its name. And this letter appears in the Torah with a crown on top. So it's symbolic of the crown of the Torah. Okay? And Zavulan were the ones who would work. Remember, uh, Yisachar and Zavulan used to have a partnership. They were workers. Weird, right? You, would have, you probably should have put the Torah tribe, Torah studiers, to have control of Sivan. But in Kemach, in Torah, if there's no flour, if there's no sustenance, if there's no money, there is no Torah. And therefore, Zavulun, who go to work, who make a living, they're the ones <clears throat> who become the twin tribe because they're the ones who are partnering up with everyone else in order to bring success into Gemini twin fashion into the month, the Hebrew Jewish month, that is Sivan. That is Sivan. We've run out of time. I know we've only done three. We did a big introduction. And we've done three of the months, right? Which leaves us with a number more. We're going to revisit this topic at a future time. Not sure exactly. It may not be next week. And we are going, my friends, to see how the rest of the Jewish month actually envelope and return back to the starting point together with the other tribes that come with us. So thank you all for uh, joining us. It's, it was a long class, nearly 45 minutes. I will, God willing, bring a part two to bring the Zodiac home for us as we finish off the Jewish year. Have an amazing evening. I'll be on tomorrow at 12 o'clock, 12 p.m. Please do join me here, same channel, and we'll be looking at more relationship uh, ideas and tips and statements tomorrow, actually, um, 10 or 12 statements that are uh, unproductive when it comes to relationships. Have a great evening. Thanks for joining.